Um, so we decided to pull this panel together, and you are going to hear uh, who's going to moderate this is Mac McKenzie, who wrote the book Money, Power, Respect, all about women in sports and really changing the face of feminism. We also have incredible panelists, and I'm just going to fangirl for one moment as somebody who grew up in New Jersey. I love the Harlem Globetrotters. I'm also a basketball fanatic, so you get we get the pleasure of also having one of the Harlem Globetrotters. How many of you knew that there were women that played on the Globetrotters? One, two, three. Okay, like this is amazing. It's a milestone. All right, so Mac, come on up. And we also have Bonnie and we have Katya. So come on up. Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to see that so many people played sports because you're really going to like this conversation. <laughs> so you're in the right spot. Um, so as Kate said, my name is Michaela McKenzie. I'm a journalist and author. Just wrote a book about sports and specifically how they shape culture and our ideas about women, what their bodies can do, what they're worth, why it's so important that we're all paying attention to sports and the messages that they're sending. Um, so I'm so, so excited to be joined by these incredible women who all have very personal and powerful relationships with sports um, and to kind of dig into how they can affect us on an individual level when it comes to physical health, mental health. A lot of us have probably thought about that, but also financial health. Um, so I'm going to read their bios because they're all so amazing that I feel like we just we need to know. Uh, <laughs> so first, I am joined by Bonnie Bernstein, who is an Emmy Award-winning journalist with two decades of on-air experience covering the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, and college football and basketball for ESPN and CBS. She is now the founder of her own multimedia production company, Walk Swiftly Productions. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Matt. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Next up, we have Katya Price. She is the founder and CEO of Dance Body. She's a former professional dancer. She began teaching private sessions in New York, which quickly became sought after fitness classes. Now, over 10 years later, she's built her vision into a company with two studios in New York, classes in the Hamptons, LA, and Miami, and online classes via Dance Body Live. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, we have Fatima TNT Lister. She became the first woman since 1993 to join the elite Harlem Globetrotters in 2011. Yeah, yeah. And she has since helped usher in a new class of female talent for the Globetrotters. She is a real athlete's athlete, having competed in volleyball and track throughout her teens before going all in on basketball in college at Temple University, where she was coached by the legendary Don Staley, a name everyone should know. Um, who she credits for modeling balance, which is definitely coming in handy now as a professional athlete and mom of two. Thanks for joining us. So we're going to get into a lot over the next 40 minutes, a pretty broad topic. Um, but talking about all of the ways in which sports really impacts our agency and power in the world, the way that we show up, and that really starts with these very fundamental questions around health. Um, so to kick off, I want to ask each of our panelists to share a story about how sports has impacted their health in a way that they maybe didn't expect. I mean, we all think about sports are good for you physically, you're getting strong, yay. Uh, but how is it really affecting our health in, in more profound ways? So, Bonnie, I'll start with you. Um, gosh, so many ways. We could spend a whole hour on this. But I would say maybe the most critical thing, as it so pertains to my life and career, uh, being in sports broadcasting, while there are more women now than there ever were, there weren't very many when I started out. And I think the way sports has impacted me post most precipitously would be the understanding of the importance of resilience and the positive power of failure. Um, very rarely in sports do you endeavor to do something and it works the first time. You need to have a lot of repetition. You have to be okay falling down and getting back up again. What failure teaches us in sports is that in sports, failure is a critical key to success. And I think that's been one of the most important things for me. 
We love that. What about you, Katya? Um, <laughs> well, uh, Movement and health are completely interconnected, I think, as we would all agree. The mind-body connection is very real and very strong. But as it pertains to myself, um, I think that dancing at a young age gave me a lot of confidence in my body. And that absolutely changed the way that I thought about myself, thought about myself in the world. To be able to walk into a room with posture, with confidence, and feeling very strong on your own two feet is a blessing and a gift. And I think it's something that's really important to think about, especially for young women. Um, and most recently, I think that my health and movement were interconnected by being pregnant and dancing through my entire pregnancy, <laughs> coming through postpartum, coming back to teaching five months after. That was wild. I know we're going to get into that. but. But to be able to be confident enough in my body and see the dance teachers before me dance while they were pregnant, leading by example, I think, is, is a huge thing when it comes to seeing movement in your body and in health. I don't think we should short shrift either. Look at Katya's posture. <laughs> Look at Fatima's posture. Look at my posture. Look at Mac's posture. And, and that's important because how you carry yourself crafts perception. Yeah. It is so much more valuable than you realize because it's, it's not a physical, it's not a conversation, but how you walk into a room matters. And that a lot comes from sports, I think. Yeah, you have beautiful posture, by the way. <laughs> I'm like, girlfriend, sit up straight. <laughs> yeah, now we're being watched. <laughs> Um, for me, I think I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of what she said because the biggest impact for me has been after I had a child and tried to go back and play or did go back and play. Um, I think it just gave me more of a respect for, you know, our bodies and, you know, what we go through on a day to day and what we go through after motherhood. And I think it, um, it just kind of showed me like you, you need to know your limits, but also know that you're limitless. You know, and I think that's really powerful, and um, that's been the biggest impact for me. Even though I've been playing all these years, and I've been using my body all of these years, it wasn't until, you know, that very humbling time um, going through pregnancy twice um, that has really, you know, given me more of appreciation, I think. Amazing. We are definitely going to come back to that. Um, but I want to start with digging into that mind-body connection, because I think this is how sports shows up in most of our lives. Most of us are not professional athletes, <laughs> as much as we may dream of being. Um, and I think everyone in this room understands the mental health benefits of exercise, but it's kind of one of those things on your self-care list that's like, look, I know I'm supposed to be doing this, but maybe it falls to the bottom of that list. Maybe we do it only begrudgingly. Um, but Katya, you speak about this in a really beautiful way, and particularly when it comes to participating in sports or participating in physical activity in community and what that can do for our mental health. So tell me a little bit about how you see that play out in your work, particularly you know, as somebody who has been teaching classes pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, post-pandemic. Um, well, yes, that's, that's a huge undertaking of a question, but I will take it. Um, you know, having the pleasure of being able to train most specifically, I mean, it's dance body, right? So you can imagine 99% of my customers are female, but being able to watch women through every life phase, stage, trauma, success, go through movement during that time, it's just amazing to watch them flourish. Um, you know, I think that... <laughs> Women are so amazing and transformative, and we're always kind of moving through one to the next, and movement really helps people do that, especially in a community. There is something like, you know, when we're young, we're going to dance classes or gymnastics, and we play sports, maybe when we're younger, but when we are adults, that starts to go to the wayside. We don't have team sports. We don't have those group games anymore, and that's really sad because I think it leads to isolation. I think it leads to depression. I think you lose touch with the people around you and start when it comes to work, right, you get more competitive. And it's sad because you don't have that third space outside of work and home to have a community of like-minded people. And I think when you move in a group with people, it bonds you in a different way, you feel powerful in a different way. The oxytocin is off the effing charts, you know? So if you wanna talk about that daily dose, I talk about this a lot, which is dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. There was this amazing study that just came out about 
dancing being the best modality of movement next to SSRIs, right? And to replace an SSRI, right? To replace a drug that you may have to take. I'm not saying do this. I'm just saying it's, it's really interesting to think about. Movement can be so therapeutic. And I think that is not done in isolation. I think when you are doing that with a group, especially of women, like-minded women who are all powerfully moving together, shit changes. It just does, it has to. Your confidence changes, your community changes, and you realize that when you start talking to the people around you, you are so much more alike than you are different. And I think that is a very powerful tool as well, just to know that. So the mental health component, while we can talk about it, it's really, I find I get most of my confidence from doing and moving and being in a zone with people. It's not something to talk about, it's really, in my mind, it's something to do about. Maybe the best mind-body case study, we can do it right in this room. How many times have you forced yourself to do some sort of movement, working out, dancing, walking, when you did not want to? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Keep your hands up if you felt better afterwards. Mind-body connection, thank you, mic drop. <laughs> panel over. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, well, this is one of the things that fascinates me so much about sports, particularly for women, because they're this incredibly safe, empowering, life-changing space until they enter the public arena. And then we have this infuriating culture of comments about women's bodies, opinions about women's bodies, what they should and should not be doing. Fatima, as yeah. a professional athlete, you have to deal with this. This is part of your job. So yeah. tell me a little bit about what that was like when you returned from playing or when you returned from um, maternity leave after your daughter yeah. was born. Yeah, unfortunately, you are very, very, very correct. Um, I don't know if you guys ever checked the comment section under a, a female sports clip, um, but it's, it's disturbing. It's dark. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I think, you know, I just kind of, I think since I've been playing sports for so long, and um, as a little girl, playing sports, especially basketball, which is very male-dominated, you have to prove yourself every single time you step on the court. It's, it's, a, it's been an uphill climb since I was 12. So, you know, um, seeing those comments, unfortunately, you know, those are not things that I haven't heard before. But I think it's about being um, strong in yourself and what you believe in and knowing that you are part of something that's bigger than yourself. Um, for me, playing with the Harlem Globetrotters, a lot of you guys haven't come to a game in a while, so this is your, yeah, <laughs> come on out. Um, but there are a ton of little girls who come to, bas to the basketball game now, and I love that. And I know that me being out there and being a representation, a lot of times I'm the only female. So how it works, we have, I'm going to just tell you how it works real quick. So we have the Harlem Globe Charters. We split up into three units so that we can play in different places at once. So there's usually only one female on each unit. So I am the, the only female representation, you know, at all of these games. So um, for me, you know, it's you know, it's bigger than those comments. I know that I'm part of something that's bigger than myself. Um, and I think that's what keeps me going in terms of, you know, just wanting to prove people wrong. And when those little girls come up to me after the game and they're like, I want to be like you, and there's little boys who come up, I want to be like you when I grow up, um, it really, you know, makes me feel like I'm making some kind of a difference. Um, and then after having my, my child, a lot of the moms are like, you know, I see them come up. So one of, I, I think one of the most rewarding things for me after the game, I see them come up and they're, they're dragging their, their little boy up to me. And they're like, see, she's a mom too. And you know, and it's kind of like they want that validation. And, and don't we all want that validation from our kids? Like, I'm cool. Um, so, you know, if I can be that for someone and, you know, show them that we can, you know, tackle these big dreams and still balance being a great mom, a great wife, um, and, you know, kind of try to have it all. Um, I feel really honored, you know, that I get to, to be that. Comments and all, I, I feel good about it. Yeah. Nice. Katya, you, you have some experience with this, too, on social media. Oh, social media. <laughs> um, yes, uh, so when I was maybe like 
eight months pregnant. I, you know, because I had had so many dance teachers through the years who were, they were doing pirouettes up until the time they gave birth. So in my mind, this was just normal. I did not realize how triggering it was for people to see a pregnant woman working out really hard. And not that every pregnant woman should work out really hard. This is what I do for a living. And it was my business of 10 years. Like, this is what I do every single day. Totally safe. My healthcare providers knew, like, I checked in with them. So it's just what I did. I did not realize how triggering it was for other people to see it. So I had a post that I very innocently made thinking like, oh, you know, what's another post? What's another reel? 31 million views later, it's, it, it blew up. It was just crazy. But the amount of comments, so if you've ever gone viral, you know, now you're getting, you're getting the good, but you're also getting that dark underbelly of, we don't like this. Um, it's not safe. This is bad for your baby. Your baby's going to have this, this, and this wrong with it. Like, it's just, it's crazy. People are nuts. But also, the myths are not just coming, it's male and female, by the way. These myths are coming from all over the place. Like, you shouldn't be moving. This is bad for you. Um, how dare you do this? It's such a bad representation for women. Um, you're vain for working out while you're pregnant, which is completely BS. It's so healthy for mom and baby. And if anyone would take two seconds to Google that, it's not very, you don't have to go very far to understand the amazing amount of health benefits mentally and physically for the mom and the baby. Now, there are varying degrees of movement that everyone may want to do during pregnancy, but for me, it was doing the sport that I loved for most of my life, but that was very upsetting to a lot of people. So instead of deleting the negative comments, I took it upon myself to be like, I am now answering every negative <laughs> comment. Fake news, not true, Google this. Like, <laughs> I, just, I just went on a PR campaign for myself because I'm like, no, this is an important conversation because it is 2023 20, at the time and we still think that women shouldn't be moving during pregnancy, that's actually insane. So it's interesting to get that kind of feedback, but to your point, Fatima, it did not make me wanna stop. It did not ever make me feel bad. I'm like, no, this is, this is my time to shine. This is my Super Bowl. It's interesting because on one hand, I agree, Katya, that the time to have the conversation is now. But the other thing that I think we've all had to learn through sports in whatever you know, facet we're in as a player, as, a, as a, an instructor, an entrepreneur, as somebody who's a former athlete and a broadcaster, anybody who's public facing, we deal with this. And it's very easy to get caught up in the hate. And it's so important, and, and this isn't applicable just to sports, it's just applicable in life to understand that everybody comes to your social feed from a different life experience. And so it's really easy to take things personally. And if there's one thing I've learned that's enabled me to maintain my mental health and sanity, is that if you can understand that everybody's looking at your post, your circumstance through their own individual lens, you can respond, whether you're physically responding or responding in your head with compassion. Because hatred towards somebody you don't know is not genuinely hatred towards you. There's something else about your life, your experience, your environment that's making you lash out in that way. And they are projecting their negativity on you. So it's been one of the most important lessons I've learned that you know, lives in our sports world, but I, I do think is a, is a really valuable broader message. Bonnie, you know, you and I both come at this from the journalistic perspective of understanding that women's sports, for whatever reason, we could spend 10 hours on that, trigger all of these thoughts and feelings about women's bodies and what they're capable of. How have you seen that conversation evolving over you know, the past 20 years that you've been in this world and you've been covering sports, you know, going from this very long history of women being actually prevented from playing sports because of concerns over their reproductive health to now seeing athletes compete longer than what we ever thought was possible before um, simply because they have more support in doing that? Yeah. I mean, to your point, literally back in the day, women were not allowed to participate in any sort of physical activity because our primary function on earth was to pop out children. And any sort of vigorous activity that could impact our ability to do that was voodoo. So clearly, we've 
Thanks, Caitlin Clark. We've come a long way. But, but when you look at, like, societally, why we've made such big strides, I think one of the big factors has been Title IX. In the event you're not familiar with Title IX, it was actually an educational law that was passed back in 1972 that required any sort of institution that had financial funding to provide equal opportunity across the board for gender. There was nothing about sports actually in the language of this law, but most one of the most visible areas where we've seen progress is in sports. So equal opportunity without getting into the minutia between men and women. Since 1972, when those doors flew open, with each passing generation, there's more opportunity for girls to play sports. When you think about how those little girls started playing sports and grew up, having played sports and how that's impacted opportunity, it's had a huge impact in the workplace. Why? Because 94% of female C-suite executives played sports. The majority of them have it attributed life skills they learn through sports as a key to their success. Leadership, confidence, accountability, resilience, discipline, the ability to push beyond your boundaries, being able to set goals, being able to learn about time management, all of these things have been critically important. So when you look on a macro level about the importance of the increase in women playing sports, it's not just the girls participating, like in that little bubble, it's the broader impact of sports that's empowered women to thrive in the workplace, I think. I want to spend a minute talking about that because I think this is such an important part of this conversation about sports is that it literally has the power to impact our financial health individually, but also collectively to change what the set of opportunities looks like for women. That research that you're referencing is a study that was done by Ernst & Young a few years ago. I'll repeat it because it's everyone needs to really note this. 94% of female C-suite executives played sports. That is not a coincidence. And there's so much to be said about why that is on sort of a personal level and also when we think about it from a systemic level. Similarly, research has shown that women who played sports in high school go on to make more money. Um, so I'd like to ask each of our panelists to share a way in which their experience with sports, their relationship with sports has impacted your sense of financial agency? Well, I started a company over it, so, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, <laughs> I was like, you know, you got to use what you got. And I think when I moved to New York, I actually moved here to be a performer and mm -hmm kind of performing, but on a different scale. I moved here to be on Broadway, as we, as we all do. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, I, I ended up in the boutique fitness industry, and I realized that my athleticism and my performance skills, I could actually make money doing that. And as a young woman in her 20s, that's awesome. That's like an awesome sense of, I have something, and I have something of, of value, and people like it, and they'll pay for it. Like that's, that's awesome to feel. So that is really how I started my company and talk about, you know, I, I was not doing it for my financial health. I didn't have a business plan. I had to Google what an entrepreneur even was. I had no idea. <laughs> it's very trendy now and it's a buzzy thing, but like, you know, 11 years ago, I had no idea what I was doing and my family is a bunch of teachers, so they were no help, but I can teach. So <laughs> that was very helpful. My mom said, if you can be an actress, you can be anything. So there you go, musical theater degrees working for you. Um, but, but yeah, I think that, you know, at least in my, my case, because I, I was so confident in my body and because, you know, you can, you can perform, you can lead group fitness, you can get into professional athletics. I think having that confidence does instill a sense of self. And when you have a sense of self, you know, you don't get told no very often because the word no is just an opportunity to overcome adversity and find out what's the maybe, what's the yes. So I think for me, it gave me a lot of confidence just to be able to pursue my own path. Yeah, I think I'm gonna uh, piggyback off that a little bit because it does give you confidence in a lot of ways, not just you know on the 
for me on the court, but off of the court. Um, it, it opens up so many opportunities for people um, to want to hear my story, people who, you know, I may not have ever met or they, they didn't know I exist. And um, so it's given me a lot of opportunities to go and, and speak with little girls and um, other women um, and just kind of empower them and encourage them to, you know, reach for their dreams. And it's, it's really just the confidence, I think, for me uh, personally is, is what it it's done for me, yeah. I think, I think sports, too, um, in terms of how it empowers financial health, sports teaches us about the power of team. Through sports, we realize it's okay to ask for help. Through sports, we realize that it takes a village. When you're participating in team, I mean, it's a little bit different in individual sports, but you still need a team. You have coaches, you have trainers, you, are pe you have people who are helping you with nutrition, recovery, all these sorts of things. And so the concept of team is very innate to those of us who have been athletes. And why that matters is if you are intentional about having the right teammates around you, what do we know? A rising tide lifts all ships. In many cases, it's a financial ship, and everybody benefits when you have the right team around you and you work together as a collective. Beautiful. I love the idea of making this actionable for people because, Katya, to your point, most of us don't have that team environment today. We can talk all day about how sports is so beneficial to us, but unless we are Fatima, we probably aren't in a situation where we get to play a sport every day. Um, so how can we bring these ideas and the very real connection between sports and health into our lives as, as professional women, as working women? Um, how, how can we pull that into our routines? Easy. You can stream dancebodylive.com. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless, shameless, shameless plug. Performer, entrepreneur, what do you want from my life? So, so I, I think that, you know, with COVID, right, we saw a major shift in the ties with how people are using their workouts, using their time, right? Uh, Pre-COVID, I, I heard a lot about, I want a six pack, I want to lose weight. And post-COVID and during COVID, it was much more about like, I'm going insane. I need to do something. I need to see my people. I don't have access anymore. So when we started to stream online and made it way more accessible, by the way, I launched streaming in 2016 because I'm from Detroit, Michigan. We literally have nothing there. So thank you, Detroit. OK, girl. I love it. Love it. Um, so, you know, I grew up doing Taibo on tape and like we didn't have boutique fitness was not a thing. So it was always important to me to make it accessible. And I think that's number one is however it's accessible to you. Courtney, I'm going to out you. I love Courtney for us. She's sitting right here. She comes to my class all the time. You worked out today? Yes. I love it. With, you. With me. Right. Yes, exactly. And <laughs> Courtney, how did you work out today? From my apartment. From your apartment. <laughs> there you go. Were you in your pajamas? Uh, no. There you go. See, we have a two-way camera. You can turn it on or off. But, but the point of the matter is she got to have that, that dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphin fix from her living room. It, it's all about making it accessible for you. Now, I love to see Courtney in person. I see Ferris here. Ferris, did you work out today? Every other day. Okay. <laughs> she had to look hot today. So in fairness to Ferris, I get it. I get it. But, but you know, being in that classroom, do you feel a shift in your, in your energy Right. Right. Correct. And, and especially post COVID, and especially for women post COVID, if you had kids, if you were a teacher, if you were an essential, it's, it's like, holy crap, we got a lot going on up here, and I need to see my people, and I need a release. And it became way less about my body needs to look like this, and way more about I need to connect with someone else who's of like mind because that is what sustains me and feeds me. So I do think the online access is huge for people. I only have two studios. It's awesome, it's fun if you can get there, but if you can't, Live classes, so those live classes that are happening in our studios, you can stream them in your living room 10 times a day, which is, which is the way to do it. So I do think making it accessible for yourself and also making it a priority. I find that people do not prioritize their workouts. When I talk to people, the number one thing I hear is, oh, I don't have time. By the way, there's a million reasons to not work out. I, I get it. I made it my job so that I could work out every day. This is how sick and crazy I am. Just kidding. <laughs> but, I, but I do love it, and I, I, I made it a, a 
a pillar of my life because that was important to me. And I found real meaning and real purpose and real financial success in that. So I think, you know, if you say it's a priority, that's one thing. But if you make it a priority, if it's that important meeting on your schedule that you do not miss, it's that pill you do not not take every day, movement is medicine. I firmly believe that. And the more we see tests and studies and diagnoses and chronic illness, the more we start to understand, oh, yes, movement is a really important part of that equation. Um, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I think people just need to make it a part of however accessible it needs to be for them, wherever it fits in their day, that's how it needs to work. Sorry, I took over your panel. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Bonnie, same question to um, you. You touched on something and you glossed over it, so I'm going to highlight it. Okay. What we learn in sports is the importance of routine and discipline. One of the ways you can make activity and self-care part of your routine is by putting it in your calendar and treating that time before your day gets started, at the end of the day, if your significant other is going to spot you some time on weekends and, and he or she's going to take care of the kids, make it a priority. Put it in your calendar and pretend it is a meeting with your boss, with your CEO, something that is life or death. You will not move it. Just psychologically, visually seeing it in your calendar is a critical commitment to yourself that will make a huge difference. Beautiful. And then Fatima, because I feel so passionately about this, and I know everyone in this panel does, what is one thing everyone in this room can do when they leave to support women's sports? I think um, just watch. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Go to Globe Trotters games. <laughs> <laughs> right, come on out. Um, I think it's just about um, just um, championing, championing, championing for one another. Supporting. Yeah, supporting each other and encouraging each other. And um, our, our our little girls. Um, I know we were on a, a Zoom meeting, and you know, dance was brought up. At, you know, um, as a little girl. And I think it doesn't matter what the sport is or what the activity is. I think it's important for us to um, get our little girls to start trying things that is out of, outside of their comfort zone. I have a daughter, she's five years old, and they're like, oh, does she play basketball? And I'm like, she is not worried about a basket or a ball. She wants to be a princess, <laughs> but it's fine. Um, she also loves dance. She's, I bought her some tap shoes and she's just tapping around the, tapping around the house. But I think it's just um, about exposing to them to different things and encouraging them to get out, out of that, that princess bubble every now and then. Um, because it, sports, um, it, it's, it's so much more than the physical activity. It's you know, what you learn. Um, you learn a lot of things that you're going to take throughout your entire life. And um, you know, I'm living testimony testament to that. So I think it's about getting our little girls while they're young and planting that seed in them so that as they grow, that seed grows, and then they'll be up on a panel encouraging someone else. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Uh, I keep doing that. Uh, so we have time for one or two questions. Any questions? Amazing. And I will say as I'm walking, not only watch women's sports, go buy tickets to the games, buy the merchandise, and if you have the opportunity, invest in women's sports. At least watch it on TV. Yeah, the TV money. Especially if you have a Nielsen box. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys so much. I totally agree with what you said about confidence and how sports gives you that. I am a mother of tween girls, and they are both into sports. God but bless I feel you. Like, yeah. uh, right? <laughs> Social media is really changing how they feel about sports. They're concerned about being embarrassed and failure. So what do you guys recommend that we say to our teen girls who are kind of facing this social media concern about sports? Can you add some color to that? I'm not quite sure that I understand. Like track, we were talking about. Uh, I remember growing up, everyone did track, or you know, you weren't really concerned about how you, how you did in that event. Maybe you were. But now, 
when I looked at my girls' team's trucks, they, you know, there was only a few people doing the actual races because they didn't want it to be filmed. And if yeah. they lost, then everyone in the school would know. Mm -hmm. So it was this whole different dynamic that, you know, you never got that immediate feedback back in the day. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll share an anecdote, um, and it's one of the ones I remember most. So I created a series called She Got Game. Uh, it's all about shining a light on diverse women who played a diverse range of sports, thriving in um, diverse industries. A lot of these women you didn't know even played sports, like Chelsea Clinton or Aisha Tyler. Um, Layla Ali is somebody, by virtue of her dad, Muhammad Ali, most people would know. But we had this whole conversation about how we feel about our bodies. Layla is a bigger woman, and she has big hands. And, she, and we got into this whole conversation about like the power of a handshake. And I'm like, you must scare the shit out of people whose hands you shake for the first time. She's so strong. And she said, what I learned through sports is that our bodies were made this way for a reason. My hands are this size because it's enabled me to knock out people and become a world champion. So what I would recommend is that you, you stress to your daughters that if they're playing sports, their bodies are made to play sports, and not everybody's is. It's a gift, no matter what anybody says. And that's probably something, that sort of body confidence, hopefully, is being circulated from their coaches trickling down to the athletes as well. Yeah, I wanted to, so I have a five-year-old, and you know they're very tech savvy. So I'm kind of in that boat as well. I think if I'm understanding what you're saying is it's the, fail, uh, it's the fear of failing on camera because that lives forever, right? And it's like, you know, I don't even want to try because if it, this happens and people are going to see this forever. So I think what I've been thinking about this myself, so I'm glad you brought that up. So um, the approach that I'm taking is to expose my daughter to women who have failed on camera and show her that they bounce back and life goes on, and we all fail. And you're not gonna do, you know, you're not gonna win every time. You're not gonna do the best every time. So I've been going out of my way to try and find examples of women who have had embarrassing moments, who have, you know, been expected to win but didn't win. Um, and they bounce back, and you know, and they're thriving, and life goes on. So that's, that's where I'm at. We're gonna wrap up. We have our last conversation, but before I do, where can they find each of you? Um, on my Instagram, it's probably the best, TNT underscore 18 underscore. So I would love to chat with anyone who feels like, I, I try and answer my, my stuff, and I follow back. So. <laughs> Same. I do it all myself. I'm like, I answer every DM. I, I'm weird about it. I, I don't want anyone else in there. It's like personal email. DMs are very personal. These um, you can find me, uh, you can find my company at Dance Body. We actually have a studio two blocks down from here at our Nomad location, 27th and Broadway, if you'd like to join. Uh, if you'd like to join online, dancebodylive.com. We have live classes and on-demand classes that will fit into your schedule no matter what. You can find me personally at Katia, K-A-T-I-A, underscore dancebody on Instagram. And as viral as it gets, I always answer every single DM. So tell me you were here. If you tell me you came to this panel today, I will hook you up with a free class. So don't forget that. It's at Katia, K-A-T-I-A, <laughs> underscore dancebody. And you will get a free class. It's expensive. If I were your social media manager, I would have told you, you have to follow her and then let you know. And then you will get a free class. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am at Bonnie Bernstein, mostly on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me on LinkedIn, and my website is bonniebernstein.com. I tried to come up with something more original, and that, that's where we landed. So, yeah. Mac? Um, you can similarly find me at MichaelaMcKenzie.com um, or on Instagram, I'm at Mac. Amazing. Thank you guys so, so Thank much. You. Thanks, Kate.